Hey everyone, and welcome to our presentation on the problem of induction by Karl Popper. Today we're going to look at his past, and then we're going to go through the arguments seen in the problem of induction, that paper, as well as following up with a, a look at what his critics say about him. First we're going to start with his past. Karl Raymond Popper was born on July 28, 1902 in Vienna, Austria. He died on September 17, 1994 in London, England at the age of 92 years old. His parents were of Jewish background and partial Hungarian descent and made a rapid social climb in the Viennese society. Another prestigious Viennese citizen was Johann Strauss, who was providing the musical score of this presentation. Popper received a Lutheran upbringing and was educated at the University of Vienna. His education was supplemented by his father's own personal library of over 12,000 volumes. It was said that Popper inherited both his father's library and the disposition of a bibliophile. Popper's politics. While still a young boy, Popper found himself drawn to Marxism and joined the Association of Socialist School Students, as well as the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Austria. He eventually abandoned the Marxist ideology and adopted a social liberalist point of view. He remained a social liberalist for the rest of his life. Popper the Postgrad. Soon after his doctorate in philosophy, Popper wrote his first book, Logique de Forschung, and taught at the high school level for a number of years. In 1937, with the threat of Anschluss, the German annexation of Austria, Popper emigrated first to New Zealand and later to England, where he was appointed professor at the University of London. Some prizes and acknowledgments of Popper include the Lippincott Award of the American Political Science Association, the Stunning Prize, Fellowships in the Royal Society, British Academy, London School of Economics, King's College, London, Darwin College, Cambridge, and Charles University in Prague. Austria also awarded him the Gold Honor in Grand Decoration for Services to the Republic of Austria. And finally, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. Okay, now we're going to move on to the basics of the problem with induction. So, many different philosophers have different reasons for explaining this problem. Popper chooses a few, there's also a lot in the paper, but unfortunately we don't have enough time to go through them all, so we're going to go with the main one, with Hume. Hume had two major problems with induction. His first question was that, are we rationally justified in reasoning from repeated instances of which we have had experience to instances of which we've had no experience? Basically what he means here, can we use our experiences to justify what might happen in the future where we have no experience? His answer to this is we are not justified, regardless of the number of, current, of occurrences that we may have experienced. Um, the second question is why do we all have expectations and why do we hold on to them with such great confidence or strong belief? Basically, why do we believe what we believe? He says we believe this because of the irrational but irresistible power of the law of association and that we are conditioned by repetition. What I believe Hume means by the fact that we are conditioned by repetition and that we are so involved with this law of association is that we only have our experiences to rely on and when things are repeated constantly we fall into a false sense of security so we always assume that they're going to happen in the future. Um, granted, he thinks this is a huge problem, but at the same time, it lets people function day to day. So it can't really be that bad. Next, we're gonna move on to this whole idea of induction in really basic layman's terms. Feel free to ask us after the presentation too if you have any questions about this. But back in the beginning, near the beginning of the semester, we were given the situation that since the sun has risen every day for as long as anyone can remember, what is the rational proof that it will rise tomorrow? How can one rationally prove that past events will continue to repeat in the future just because they have repeated in the past? Um, we all know that, yes, the sun has been rising for millennia, and we can also not know that for sure it's going to rise again tomorrow, but Popper says that while there is no way to prove this, um, it's possible to formulate the theory that every day the sun will rise. If it does not rise on some particular day, the theory will be falsified and will have to be replaced by a different one. This proves that it's a scientific theory, which is what we've been going through with the first four or five weeks of the semester so far. So until this day, there's no need to reject the assumption that the theory is true, even though it is falsifiable. So we're just gonna go along with that because Honestly, it makes your life a lot easier if you're thinking that, oh, the sun's gonna rise, the world's gonna be okay tomorrow. Um, neither is it rational, according to Popper, though, that 
to make a more complex assumption that the sun has risen until a given day, but will stop doing so the next day. Um, making it more complicated for yourself. Today is complicated enough as it is. We don't need to make any more complications. May as well just go with the easiest way and continue believing that the sun will rise every day until it doesn't. And we'll deal with the consequences of the sun not rising when that day may come. Um, now we're gonna move on to the critics of Popper, what they say and what they really mean. Most of Popper's critics challenge his ideas around uh, falsification, uh, which state that in order for a theory to be considered scientific, it must be falsifiable. So Thomas Kuhn is one of those, and he says that these methodologies would make science impossible because scientists work in a series of paradigms. Carl Gustav Hempel also has a problem with the falsifiability because we have a perfectly, if we have a perfectly logical sounding hypothesis, like for every metal there is a temperature for which it will melt, these, this hypothesis it cannot be falsified even though it appears to be a valid hypothesis. Finally, John Gray says that if a theory were scientific only insofar as it is falsifiable and should be given up as soon as it is falsified, then theories like of Einstein and Darwin would have been killed at birth because when their theories were first introduced, each of them was at odds with some available evidence at the time, and it was only later that the evidence became available to give them the support that they needed. And now we are going to wrap up this presentation with the final big message that we hope you all leave with. Welcome to the big picture. The big thing you get from reading any of Popper's work is that a theory must be falsifiable. We also found from this reading in terms of the problem of induction, just because a theory seems to be true, through your repetition, through any experience, just like the sun rising that we talked about earlier in the presentation, doesn't mean that it necessarily is, or that it always will be. The other big thing that you get from Popper is that falsification is so necessary. I know I just said that 30 seconds ago, but you need to be able to prove it to be false through testing to make it scientific. Um, as we saw through the, the critics, they completely disagree with him for many reasons, but this is just Popper's viewpoint. Thanks to everyone for watching our presentation and hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions about anything, don't hesitate to ask. Thanks guys.